Aurora, welcome to Shiro's Mixtape Memoir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. What a pleasure to see you. Oh, it's very nice to see you as well. I always love to start by asking you to help us set the scene. We're going to go back to your earliest musical memories. Where are we and when are we? Um, we're in Norway, <laughs> in a city called Bergen. Or actually an hour outside in, a, in an even smaller place called Us. And even more further outside of Us, there's an even smaller place called the Fjord of Light, I guess. That's where I come from. And in a little house, <laughs> just at the edge of a little cliff, you can kind of see the fjord, its curves. And you can see the mountains stretch on the other side of the fjord, like all the way back until they become this light blue color because they're so far away. It's a very beautiful place, my, my childhood home. And on this specific day that I'm going to take you all back to, it's, uh, it's raining. Do you want to start with the first song? Do we go right there? We can start. Tell us about hearing this song for the first time. Leonard Cohen is one of my Suzanne biggest heroes. I feel like he contains or contained a lot of divine feminine energy, or like goddess energy, if you know what I mean. His, uh, his poetry touches an important place in the soul, I think. And when I heard this song, I was very young. I didn't completely understand what he was singing, what the words meant. But still somehow I could really, really understand what the words meant. And I remember coming home from school and it always took me an hour to walk home, even though it was a 10 minute walk, because I got so distracted by the forest and the trees and all the little creatures that live there and the sky and you know, feeling rain on my face and all of these lovely distractions the world contains. And I remember being just soaked, all my clothing really wet, and I was really cold. And I walked in to our house and my mother was there and it was only me and her and she was making something in the kitchen. I can't remember the smells, but I can remember her and how she felt so warming. My mother is a very warm creature. She's very special. And I remember really understanding her specialness that day. Because I was just looking at her. I think I was around six years old. And listening to this song. And Suzanne. I just felt like I could feel like he, he was singing about her. Or a woman like her. A remarkable woman. And I just felt like this, this song was the embodiment of, of my mother. And it will always remind me of her, I think. And then you think maybe you'll trust him For he's touched your perfect body with his mind Now Suzanne takes your hand and she leads you to the river she is wearing rags and feathers from the salvation army counter and the sun pours down like honey on our lady of the harbor and she shows you where to look among the garbage and the flowers there are heroes in the seaweed there are children in the morning they are leaning out for love and they will lean that way forever While Suzanne holds the mirror And you want to travel with her And you want to travel blind And you know you can trust her For she's touched your perfect body 
So interesting that that song was initially written as a poem. Did you know that? Yeah, I did. I did. And that Judy Collins recorded it first. Yeah. It is a poem. It is a poem. Oh, absolutely gorgeous. And the stillness of it, it's very, oh, what is it called in English? Stoic? Stoic? Stoic, calmness? yes. Yeah. It's very like that. It feels like meditating and it's just, uh, and it also feels like the last sun rays of, of a day mm. hitting your face and warming you up for just one last time before it disappears. Very like sentimental, but warm. Now, would this have been playing on a family record player or mm. yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we didn't have a radio or like a music TV uh, when I grew up. So we only had a little bit of music. The records my mom and dad had, mostly Cohen, <laughs> Some Enya and some Bob Dylan, but my favorite were always Cohen, and it's still, it's still my favorite. So you said that you were six when you heard this, and if I'm remembering your story right, you started playing the piano right around that time. Mm -hmm, I did. I discovered an old keyboard, and the, the power button didn't work, <laughs> so I had to hold it in physically while playing with just one hand. But I made some sort of device, so it will hold in the button for me, and I could play with two hands. But yeah, I started playing around six, and it just made me feel like I, I woke up. <laughs> and you were also dancing already, I think, right? Or oh, did yeah. that come later? No, I danced from, from the minute I could stand. I love dancing. I feel very beautiful when I dance. And I think somehow, all my life, I felt, I've always felt very beautiful. Like, in my existence, as a human, the pure beauty of movement and freedom is very striking to me. And I, and I feel very in tune <laughs> with a certain kind of beauty that is flawless and chaotic and much more meaningful. <laughs> than the perfect beauty that obsesses the world. And, you know, I, I love dancing. I dance so much. Yeah, I've been dancing all my life. When you were dancing as a kid, was that ballet or...? Well, um, I danced just whatever... I call it like just freedom dancing. You just follow your body's initial requests <laughs> and you just do it but I did also dance ballet from I was six to 16 mm -hmm. I had to quit be because I was signed as an artist and I didn't have time to do both so I had to choose my path and I chose music <laughs> but I still danced though so I kind of did choose both but I didn't I didn't know that at the time that I could dance and you know sing <laughs> but it, it was um yeah ballet I liked the the poise of the body ballet requires you to have. It feels very strengthening and proud and like very very worthy. Mm. I was thinking about you as a child. Now, where do you fall in the lineup of you and your sisters? Are you the youngest? You're the baby, right? Yes, I'm the baby and I'm... Ten years younger than the oldest child in our family. Um, so I came quite late as a just last minute child. <laughs> but I'm happy that they made me because I enjoy, I enjoy being here on earth. <laughs> so I'm very happy that they gave me a body to experience life in. <laughs> uh, but yes, I'm the youngest. So that sounds like a very feminine household that you yes. grew up in. And your mother's a midwife too, right? Yes, mother is a midwife. And me and my sisters, my father is um, a feminist. <laughs> and he's gotten very good at being in touch with his feminine side. His emotional self is very good. And even our pets, they were always women as well. It's a very feminine household. We're 
It's a house of witches. <laughs> so can you describe a little bit for us that house with all those women in it and the pets and what a daily mm. life look like? Um, well, I don't actually remember so much. When I grew up, I was very in my own world. I didn't always notice things around me, or I did, but, but when I did, I found the impressions of the world very overwhelming. So I often disappeared into myself, but in a, in a good way, because the inside of myself was a very exciting, intriguing place. My soul I had a lot of territory to explore within myself, and I found out very fast in life that I, I find myself very entertaining <laughs> and I really enjoy my own company and I spent most of my days in the forest anyway they had to actually call me inside again with with a bell they had this huge bell outside our door and when it was time for me to come back in and go to bed they just rang me in with this bell and I could hear it from far far away and then I had to get back as quickly as I could <laughs> how many pets were in the house we had um, mostly just dogs and cats, many cats. I loved them all. I've always imagined that I have this spirit animal called Septimus, and I felt like his soul just reincarnated into every pet I ever had. Like it, he, he was the same. And Septimus is a he or a they, and all the cats were a she, but it didn't really matter because I knew that... Um, you know, his soul didn't need to be defined by the body he lived in. But yeah, so I feel like I've only had one pet, Septimus, but in the shape of many. We're with Aurora here on Shiro's Mixtape Memoir. I'm Carmel Holt. Should we play this next selection yes. here? What can you tell us about Max Richter and how this music came to you? I can't remember, actually the exact moment where I was when I discovered the song because the song took me away <laughs> and it lifted me up from the surface of the world. But I remember being close to the ocean and I remember the enormous sense of freedom being imprinted in my, in my mind when I heard it. It's a very special song. So he took the Four Seasons by Vivaldi and basically yeah. deconstructed and reconstructed it, right? Yeah, he did. But I feel like it's about preserving the soul of the music and just changing its skin and body, uh, which doesn't really matter because the soul of, of, of any song is there no matter how you wrap it or change it and I really like that it's very and it sounds like everything it sounds like small rivers it sounds like falling in love and first kisses and dancing in the rain it sounds like jumping from a cliff into the ocean and it sounds like birds flying and animals running and children 
seeing snow for the first time and all of these beautiful things, it sounds like the essence of life to me and birth and spirit. Oh, I really love it. It's a very good soundtrack to add to your own life because it, it will make you feel like if you put this song on when you walk outside. I think it's called Spring One by Max Richter. And if you put it on when you walk outside your apartment, it will remind you somehow to like really properly look around you and look at people and you see beauty. Because it's, it's, it's easy to be fooled, I think, to miss out on the beauty in the people around you. Because it all gets translated as noise because it's so much of it. But this song helps you kind of see more than noise, but individual sounds and beings and voices and happenings is very important. So I would recommend putting on this song just once in a while because it it also touches somewhere forgotten, I think, in the soul. <laughs> The word that I kept thinking about when we were listening to it was wonder. Yeah, wonder. That's very true. And I feel like the world is so full of wonder. The animals, the way they are. Nature, food, <laughs> love, and children, dancing, freedom. All of these instinctive, free things that exist around us and inside us every day. But we forget so often to value it. Because we get distracted by so many meaningless things. And we let so many meaningless things define us. Like how we look, how we feel. And it really breaks my heart how many people are concerned with their body instead of just enjoying food. And food is art, food is music, food is life. And it's just, it just it's, it's very sad. Because it's, it's like we're getting deprived of enjoying the essence of, of this miracle of a life we've been given. And it's so rare and it's so long. Even though we say it's short all the time, life is extremely long. It's the longest thing we'll ever have, I think. Life is, um, is very eternal, even though it's not. But I feel like, oh, I don't know. And when you get reminded of, you know, that you're here now and then when you're gone, you're gone. So it doesn't matter if you fail, <laughs> you know. And this song just ah, reminds you of, yeah, exactly, the wonders of the world. And I think when you're in tune with the wonders of the world, it's easier to let small, important things make you happy rather than letting big, unimportant things make you unhappy. When you were a child, we touched on the moment that you found the piano, talking about wonder. Can you paint a picture for us of that time where you're discovering the piano, but you're playing in secret? <laughs> yes. Well, I feel like it's rare to have something just for yourself. And when I discovered the act of creating when I discovered that I I could make something that didn't exist and I can make it into something that exists like grabbing it out of thin air it's just it's a remarkable thing and it make it made me feel so so calm and so happy like an overwhelming happiness that I I know why I'm here and I I know why I matter and why life matters. It kind of gave me an eye-opening answer <laughs> when I discovered that I could make make music. It was just oh, amazing. And I um, I really felt the need to explore the way this made me feel and explore the melodies coming from my heart into my hands and on the piano. And I didn't sing at first. I just played and listened to not only the notes, but especially the space between the notes when the piano just hangs in the air, the echo of it. 
That's my favorite sound. The silence in between. That's music too. And I remember just feeling like, oh, I need to really dive deep into this and understand. Like the, the philosopher in me had a very deep need to really explore what this was. And I'm still exploring. I st I'm still wondering. I still don't know. But that was kind of the start of it all. And I had no intention or need. Uh, it didn't even occur to me that I would ever share it with anyone. Because that was really besides the point. It just occurred to me when you were talking about discovering how you could make something out of nothing and being in the music, actually occupying that space and being part of making it and making the sounds. And you're already dancing. Do you recall how those things might have clicked into place for you? Do you remember that movement feeling different once you shifted into actually making music? Did that change that relationship at all for you? Well, it kind of did. If I think about it, it may, it may have. I think it made me understand how both the music and the dancing is not something that is within me that I flick off and on. It's something that flows through me because I feel very much like the music flows through me like a river of some kind it's almost like a vessel and it's the same with dancing because it's temporarily it's, it's the thing that it's an epiphany or a thought or a need that just exists in your body when you dance and when it's over and you've done it and you feel content with with the movement then you move on in life and, and you're done with it. So dancing is also the same kind of in the moment thing, which is why I find it so beautiful because it's very only in the moment, the pure beauty and, and, and pleasure of it. So it's kind of the same thing, like a, just this outerworldly thing just flowing through you and you just have to do it. Ballet is a very stringent, with a lot of rules, And I'm thinking about you talking about being like a river and letting things flow through you. And those two things don't necessarily coexist very well. That's why I um, felt like it was my right path in life to, to quit. Because now I dance like a river again, which I enjoy much more. Because ballet is beautiful, but it, ha it has nothing to do with... The beauty I was talking about. Yeah. The flawed human beauty that free, freeful dancing is to me. <laughs> and ballet kind of took away and replaced it with flawless beauty, which is also beautiful, but not right, for me at least. When did you start to sing? I think I was around nine, so three years later. What was it that you sang? Um, mostly my own songs. A lot of wordless singing, humming and kind of nature calls and a lot of folk, just improvising. But yeah, that's when I started writing my own songs with my voice, with, with words and also without words. That's when I became a storyteller, I think. You mentioned Leonard Cohen and Bob Dylan And who's the third? Enya. And Enya. I was just going to ask about any women's voices that you heard that you really connected with. Yeah. Enya. Yeah. I really, she was, um, or she's still one of the few that gives me a musical experience without being overstimulated by like the, the harsh frequencies of of the now <laughs> it's very meditative which I like and I've always found her very yeah she's had an important presence in my life definitely do you have a favorite song? Eh Budai this to me sounds like reconnection Thank you. 
I just this was her and this song to me was the first solid proof that music is important that music is healing that's when I understood that oh well music does things to the mind the soul that nothing else can do I really understood the even like medical importance of it when I heard this song because this is medical to me and it's always been it's beautiful isn't it funny as we've been going through these songs like I said you know wonder came up as a word in my head when we were listening to the Max how do you say Richter I say Richter Richter. Richter. that's Richter. probably the right way to say it <laughs> and you said the word healing and and it was right after I had the thought I wonder what it is about certain songs that have that effect of going straight to your heart center mm. I know I think about it a lot and I know some people claim to have the answer, like an analyzing approach to like, well, well these notes are together in this chord and these frequencies, which are all a part of it, of course. But I think what makes some songs just cut right through us is a thing we will never understand. And I'm trying to understand it and, and I'm hunting for it. I've been hunting my whole career, my whole life, for these melodies, for these songs, and to make these songs as well, that hits you and goes through you and explores you and holds you and ruins you but heals you and all of these things. And I I still don't know what it is, but I know that it's it's important. And I think... I think it's a good source to to happiness, music. Were you happy as a child? I think I was. I'm very bad at analyzing myself, mm. even though I'm kind of required to do it quite a lot. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm kind of made, you know, I talk about myself more than people do because I do interviews and or talking, which is very strange. I sometimes find it very boring <laughs> to talk about myself, but it's sometimes very interesting as well, like the talk we're having now, to kind of, yeah, analyze yourself a bit through music. It's very fascinating to me because I don't do it often, so it's very new and it forces me to think about myself in a new way, which is fascinating. Um, but I don't know. I I was a happy child. I was a privileged child. And I had a very wonderful family. But I remember finding it hard to split between myself and other people and the world. So it's hard for me to remember back and think if, about my own experience in life and my own happiness. Because I, I don't know what emotions were mine because I was very bad at separating like other people's sadness especially from myself so I was sad a lot but not necessarily because of my own situation that's so wise because I think also when we're a kid I mean sometimes you never figure this out but it's hard to define that it's hard to understand especially if you're sensitive Mm -hmm wait, is the pain that I'm feeling mine or is it somebody else's? Or is this even older? Is this generational pain that Mm -hmm. has been inherited and handed down? I know. It's a very hard thing to understand, especially when you're a child, and to separate between the two. And if you're sad now because of a smell that reminded you, you know, it's very hard to understand 
our emotional self, especially because the world doesn't show us how to understand it. We get no education in school and how to understand our emotions. But we have music. Music is a good em- emotional educator. But yeah, I was happy, but I, I was very all over the place <laughs> as well. You talked about writing your first song and becoming a storyteller. And I remember you telling me that you wrote a song for your parents and that song you meant to to just be for them. You recorded it. Am I getting this right? Yeah, in 2012, because they knew I was singing a bit by the age of 14, 15. Then I had been singing in my room for many, many years. But then I started playing at the piano and the piano was located in our living room. So then I had to kind of play in front of people and I got used to it, them just being, you know, in the room as I quietly sang for myself. But they really enjoyed it. And I remember feeling the energy in the room melt and change like liquid as I was singing and telling my stories. And it was very strange to possess that power, I guess, to to change emotions in another body (laughs) than yourself. Very strange, very overwhelming. But yeah, they loved hearing me sing. And obviously I was so afraid then, I thought it was really scary. So I thought I could record a song for them give it to them for Christmas so they could hear it without me having to be there. (laughs) And then someone released the song online. And then now I'm here. (laughs) Yeah, that was like a a school friend of yours, right? Yeah. How did how did she it was a a girl, a girlfriend? Yeah, I guess how did how did she get a hold of the song? I never asked you. I think she I don't know. (laughs) Either I sent it or she was a part. Did she give the studio to me for birthday? I don't know. No, it was my math teacher who sent me to the studio. He was a very good teacher. I didn't like school, but I had some good teachers. Good teachers truly change lives. They're so important in this world. But yes, I have no idea how she got a hold onto the song. But she did. And then it was out the next day. And of course, her intentions was good. She just wanted people to hear of me. And, because I guess it makes sense for people to think that the best for everyone is to be known. I guess that's the old big dream people have to you know, be on stage and to be famous or whatever. It was never a dream of mine. It still isn't. It doesn't have, give me anything. <laughs> I love being able to to do what I do and I love people I really love people so much people are so fascinating and strange and inspiring and hopeless but also remarkable all of it so I love doing what I do but it's never I've never felt like I needed anything more in life to be happy because all the happiness was there around me in the small things. And it's still the small things that give me the most happiness. Um, But yes, now I'm drifting off. I think, yes, she released a song and my management heard it. They sent me a message on Facebook (laughs) and asked me if I wanted to be an artist. And I said, "I, I didn't want to. But then my mother convinced me into thinking that, you know, if music is medicine... I shouldn't keep it to myself. I should share it with people. And then I did. That must have been scary. It was very scary. It took me a long time to adjust. And I'm I'm quite outgoing, even though I'm an introvert, because I care so little <laughs> about what people think of me. Because people always paint their own image of you anyways. So it doesn't make any sense to fight or care about changing it into something that pleases you. Because people just have their own idea of you anyway. And I find it interesting and fascinating. But still it took me a long time to adjust. And I 
I had some moments I remember in my early career, like deep, deep within me, where I really doubted if I wanted to be an artist, if this was the life for me, this one life I have, if this is how I want to spend it, because it's so extreme. And you have to work so hard. But all people do, obviously. Life is hard. And life is easy. Depends <laughs> who you ask, I guess. But it took me a long time to understand that there was beauty in making my passion into my job. Because it was really ugly in the beginning. Or I perceived it as very ugly. And I like beauty. <laughs> but now I see the beauty in it. I really do. We are here with Aurora, and we're doing her mixtape memoir on Sono Sound System. My name is Carmel Holt. I always take a moment in the middle of these interviews to play a song by my guest and give you a rest and choose a favorite of mine. I had a hard time choosing one because I have many favorites. So I have here Murder Song 54321, the acoustic version I like playing this at this point, too, because it reminds me of when we first met, when you first came to New York, and you were just 19. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Five, four, three, two, one He holds the gun Against my head I close my eyes And bang, I'm dead I he knows that he's killing me for mercy And here I go Oh, 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 oh Oh, 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 oh Oh, 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 oh And here I go body in his arms he didn't mean to do no harm and he holds me tight oh he did it all to spend me from the awful things in life that comes and he cries and cries I know he knows that he's killing me for mercy And here I go Oh, 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 oh Oh, 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 oh Oh, 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 oh And here I go Oh, oh, oh What comes to your mind when you listen to this song? Oh, I sound so young <laughs> Um, I... I think I wrote this song when I was 16 or 17 and it's really clear to me the the way I truly discovered the the possibilities of the stories I could tell in my songs in the music and I do consider myself a storyteller and I have many stories to tell <laughs> still many of them remains untold but they will unfold with time. Do you remember where this story came from or how um, it came to you? It came from a meeting with really understanding the evil that also exists in mankind. And how easy it is when you, when you can, if you're strong, if you have power, how easy it is for so, some people to just destroy simply because they can and it took me a long time to process that this was a fact about our species 
because I grew up very isolated out in the countryside. It was very new to me when I first heard about, you know, I was young, but when I heard about that people kill, people destroy each other. So this song was a very important part of me processing this fact, I think, and writing one of the millions of stories that sadly exists out there. Yeah, I remember when I first heard it and I was thinking about how, you know, I mean, you were 19 and as you said, you wrote it when you were even younger. And part of what was so chilling about it to me was also that it was a man and a woman. And I thought about you being so young out in the world and doing this job. And when I watched the documentary about you called Once Aurora, I just saw you surrounded by so many men. Yeah, it's true. It was very strange. But it's weird because in many ways, I am also a man. <laughs> and I'm very comfortable, even though I'm very fragile. But that's the beauty in like the complexity of being a woman. We are so much... We can be so much and we are so much and we are so complex. And I find it so intriguing and inspiring. Oh, my Lord. Um, And I'm very complex too. I'm very naive. I'm very like open and fragile and emotional and sensitive and all of those things that a stranger could almost already know just by looking at me. You can already tell that, oh, you know, all of these things. But I'm also extremely comfortable in taking my space because I've never been told by my family, by my parents that I shouldn't and I grew up feeling very different, you know, from the people around me in school and etc and I found it often hard to connect to a lot of, lot of the things kids around me found important like Such fitting as. in or adapting or changing themselves or mm. the value of I don't know, I saw little value in many of the things the whole system in school was built upon. It, it just didn't uh, resonate with me at all. I think I can thank my upbringing, because I had a lot of freedom, but also I think it's the way my mind works. It's given me difficulties also in life, but it's given me a lot of good things, like the fact that I don't understand why not fitting in is a bad thing. I've never thought of it as a bad thing. It, it's lonely sometimes, but it's not, you know, but that's it. But yeah, I am, I am very comfortable in taking my space and using my voice. And I'm also, a, I know people, so I've been careful by picking people that I saw and you were kind. And I took my time and I really looked at them before I decided to work with anyone and my label as well labels I have three I I chose them all very carefully of course they chose me as well but I took my time in really making sure I had good people around me it's been a lot of men because that's often what you had to choose from but luckily I have way more women around me now it's very balanced which is good so that feels better to you to have a balance well, yes, but it does also something for the energy in the whole room when it's more balanced. I'm very into my own world, so I don't notice, I think. It doesn't matter to me. But I like the, just a principle, the idea that you, you should use the potential and knowledge and power and abilities of the women and when they are not there in the room, then you go out of the room and find them. Because, I don't know, it's an important thing. Women have so much to offer and the world forgets it every day. <laughs> Even though there is progress, we still have so much to do. So it's just, you know, it's just important. <laughs> and it matters. But personally, it doesn't affect the way I feel. Because all people affect 
affect me, if I let them affect me, if I'm in a room with them. And it doesn't matter how they how their shell looks like. But I find it really important. So your mom was the catalyst who pushed you out into the world and encouraged you to pursue music, which is amazing. Did your parents ever feel protective once you were actually out doing it? Well, yes, they're very protective. They're worried. They love me a lot and they tell me every day. And I tell them every day that I love them just the same. But they're also, they have very good faith in me and they trust me. Mm. And they respect me a lot to walk my own path, make my own mistakes and do my own rights. And they respect my my knowledge, I think, in knowing what is right for me, if that makes sense. And they're very supportive. My mom did the first push. And my father also has been a huge support and a very big help in my career because he, he's the one who has been driving me everywhere, supporting me, buying me my, my first studio equipment a long, long, long time ago. They are both very supportive and amazing parents. And they understand what it's about. They don't care about money either. They understand the, what we're doing here, which is very important for me. We have a few more songs here that we haven't played and not a ton of time left. So <laughs> where would you like to go next? We can do Wim Matten's first and then Gladiator after. Tell us why you have chose this song. Well, now we are in my late teenage years, I think. Now I'm exploring the world and I've had time to digest it because the world is very chaotic and static and hard sometimes and the noises come as little stabs and jabs like these notes here and then this is also a song that kind of represents me digesting the world and as we talked about earlier seeing through the noise and seeing all the little details in in the big world all the small things. And when you do that, when I did that, um, it, it was about a, around the time where I discovered this song. And I was uh, far away from home. I was missing the silence and the quiet and the safeness because the world felt very unsafe. And when I understood the beauty this happens. This album was released the year that you were born, Aurora. Yeah, it was. It's very true. A good year. 
1996. 1996. I don't know anything about him. You've just introduced me to him. <laughs> but I did do some research. He's released more than 60 albums so far. Six zero. I know. He's a very... I think he's made from the same endless material of just endless melodies. They come from some some place through him. Because when they come from you, eventually they will take come to an ending because the body stops somewhere at the end of your fingertips or your toes or your nose. But when it goes through you, there's no ending to the source. It's very endless, <laughs> if that makes sense. And that's how I feel about him as well. Wim Mertens. And this song is called Iris. Beautiful, beautiful song. It really helped me romanticize people and fall in love with people. The ugly and the beautiful in people. And the world and the mess of things. It helped me enjoy the smell of like old cigarettes on the streets and garbage and people being heartbroken. I don't know, it, it helped me romanticize the world. And that was important. Yeah, I mean, to do your job, especially when you come from such a beautiful, quiet, nature-filled place, there's a lot of ugliness out there. You gotta have more of a thick skin, right? Yeah, you do. And I've gotten a bit thicker, but it's not thick enough <laughs> um, yet. <laughs> but I have a whole lifetime <laughs> to grow some kind of armor. But I, I think it was just overwhelming. But also, you can change what you want, how you perceive things so easily in your mind the mind is a very powerful tool and I realize I, I, I know that now I can make something beautiful because I can if I want to and th th it's a very very powerful thing to understand and I don't know the messy and insignificant everyday nothingness feeling that exists around us a lot and within us I think it's there is beauty in that too loneliness and depression and emptiness because it's a part of this experience being here and there's a lot of ugly things, sad things, horrible things that happens out there. Injustice and, you know, oh, it's, it seems hopeless. But it's really not hopeless. People have been fighting for so long already. For equality. And we just have to continue. And we've already come so far. Like, of course there's hope. Look at the change we've already made. It's so obvious that it's that the beauty continuously wins over the over darkness, I guess. And this song to me kind of embodies that how to romanticize um, the world. When you take a moment to do what we're doing, where you do some rear view looking. And you think about yourself in this stage of your life and your career, mm -hmm. like as it was, I guess, just taking off, right? Although it was such a fast rise. Mm -hmm. How do you think that you have changed since um, then? Well, I have much more sense of that I'm on <laughs> some kind of mission <laughs> now. Or it's the wrong word, but language is such a limited tool to explain emotions but the closest word I can find is that I feel like it's a mission and what was bad about the beginning of my career was that the chaos and rawness and ugliness and 
darkness of the world distracted me from my mission. It made me forget of why I'm here and all the noise about, you know, meaningless things like money and success. It just deprives me of, of joy because it's so meaningless. <laughs> it really does not matter at all. It's all about touching hearts and, and creating. And if I ever let anything affect this core of who I am and what I do, then I could might as well just never sing again. <laughs> and when I feel like the other side, that noisy, weird side of things, gets too loud, I need to hide <laughs> and remind myself of who I am and why I'm here. And I didn't realize before after being an artist for about two years, that I, I couldn't only do this process within myself. I had to also change how I looked at people. Because to me, people became, a certain period in my life, they became this flock of eyes just staring at you and being all over you and claiming you, <laughs> owning you, using you, and it became my my anxiety took over and changed my view of people. And without my love for the people, the music, the mission is just pointless. Because it's all out of love for the people. Now, that's the core of what I do. I want to make music that can help, that can be good to people. People are so beautiful and they're so worthy and they're so important and yet the world tells them every day that they're not. And they they tell themselves every day that they're not. And the world makes us think that we're all alone in our struggles. Because we're so afraid to open up. Because the world can be so hard for the soft. And I feel like that's one thing I can try to do for at least some people. To remind them that they're not alone, that we're here together. And everything you feel... I've felt too. And everything I've ever felt, you know, it's all things we all share, all our griefs and struggles and all the darkness we keep in us are things we all know. And we're not alone. And if you open up to it, about it to someone, most likely they will look at you and they will completely understand what you mean. And I find that very beautiful. <laughs> And I think that's the biggest change, that now I I can be overwhelmed and scared, but I never let it change the way I look at humankind and the people around me. Even if there are hundreds, I still see all the beautiful individuals, which is so important. It's so important, because that's why you keep on working so hard. Because I could easily just write and sing for myself and be happy. But now that I'm here, <laughs> now that I'm an artist and I'm doing this, then the only fuel I get is the fact that there are people out there who understand. It's like shouting out into the void and suddenly you hear voices calling back and you realize that you're not alone. That's how it feels now. What about your relationship to making music? We were talking about those first moments where you were holding the, the power button on the yeah. keyboard. Obviously, you have access now to all kinds of music making tools, instruments, studios. I find it very liberating. I'm no longer limited by the lack of resources. So I feel like it's more like making music without breaks without any obstacles. Of course, you sometimes face obstacles in yourself and in the world. They're still there occasionally, but, but rarely. And I never write if I don't want to. I never sit down and think, oh, I should write something. I only write if, if something in me have already started writing and I just have to go put it down. <laughs> you know, it needs to just begin on its own. It's very instinctive. <laughs> It's, it hasn't changed. Maybe I write more 
about the we rather than the me. Do you still play? Yeah, I still play. But with a, a functional power button. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Aurora, should we go out with uh, one of song. these songs, the one yes. of these songs? So I think your last song here is Now We Are Free. Which is the perfect way to end our talk. This song, Hans Zimmer is one of my favorite composers. And this song, oh, Now We Are Free. It's just, it's full of the essence that I'm constantly looking for. This is... This is it. to thank you also for bringing this song to my attention because I was a big Dead Can Dance fan and I had no idea. I never made the connection about Lisa Gerard singing this. Her voice is stunning. I know. She's in touch with the the reconnecting urge of our souls and I feel like music has always been a way for humans to interpret but also reconnect with our own essence and with nature and with the ancient, our ancestors and history and culture. It's such an important part of our of our search for who we are and why we, we are here. And this song is a very good example. <laughs> Because it feels like it directly reconnects you as you're listening to it. What has it been like taking this musical journey back in time for you, oh, Aurora? It's been wonderful. It's rare that you get the chance to do that. You know, it's been a very interesting journey <laughs> through the heart and the mind. And I feel like it, it sounds very like me. I can, I, I recognize myself. Mm-hmm. In it, it all makes sense. <laughs> Aurora, thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for being here on Mixtape Memoir. Thank you for having me. And thank you to you, whoever out there who is listening. Thank you for spending a little time with us. <laughs> I really appreciate it.